Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tracy Scapestra and this is Embodied Learning's Body Talk. Every week we bring Body Talk to you to talk about the body, bringing the body into the classroom and into the elementary curriculum. We think this is so important because it helps with student learning, student engagement, mental health and wellness, and for thriving classroom communities. Well, today I am thrilled to invite a special guest with me today. This is Arwen Carpenter. Hi, Arwen. Hi, Tracy. How are you today? Oh, I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to have you. I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about something that I think a lot of people are going to be really interested to tune into. Um, we're going to be talking about the ways in which you have been able to explore um, Indigenous issues with your students through the arts. Mm -hmm. And this is a really big topic that I think a lot of teachers get a little bit sort of nervous about stepping into. So I think um, it'll be wonderful to have this conversation and, and, and really hopefully enlighten teachers to show them ways that they can do the same. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, I was thinking if you could just let our viewers know a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Yeah, for sure. My name is Arwen Carpenter, uh, she, her, and I'm a settler uh, here on Turtle Island. So what that means is uh, I, I do not have Indigenous heritage. My heritage is European, and so I am part of the group that colonized um, North America or Turtle Island. So I think of myself very much as a guest, mm -hmm. and in that, uh, I want to show respect you know, for the people who cared for this land for tens of thousands of years. Awesome. Thank and you. the way that I do that is, you know, honoring the land. And we can talk more about that. But that's what I mean when I say I'm a guest. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about your background in teaching and the arts as well? Uh, yeah, so I'm a dancer and choreographer. And I started dancing when I was a child and uh, was fortunate to uh, begin teaching dance when I was very young. So the the teaching years added up <laughs> quickly. And then um, I, I was, you know, just teaching in studios in, uh, and at York University in the dance department, and then decided to move into teaching for the public school board. Uh, and, and what changed my view or my mind there was I had taught uh, a student co-op where we had teenagers from different parts of the city come together for a, an opportunity to learn dance so these are not dancers and then anyway when I was able to see the transformation mm -hmm. on these kids lives that was so profound I thought oh we, we need to get this to everybody <laughs> and so I went to teachers college then and uh, have been devoted to public school yeah, I love that you say that because I think there's so many people that think that dance education is um, something that, you know, is very difficult, you know, to teach in the schools mm -hmm. and you need to, um, you know, be a, have a dance background and or only students who maybe love and appreciate dance will want to be a part of it. And what you're saying is that, you know, movement dance can have such a profound impact on all students and and while you took the lead as somebody who does have a dance background um, you know it's one of those things that we can bring into um, the experiences of many and and other teachers can learn to do that so that we reach more students in the classroom in that capacity so yeah. I, I i love that you had that experience and that led you into teachers college so that you could come into this public school system and do the work that you're doing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I mean, the other misconception is that, that a dance education really only serves you if you want to be a dancer, which is <laughs> ridiculous. We see the, you know, transferable skills that, that the skills that we're learning through movement, through dance together mm. are profound, right? They, uh, they're all, anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> But, but, but we'll get there too, I think, okay. because um, of the work that you've done. So I just, I always like to let people know sort of how it is that I know the different guests that are part of Body Talk. And we were, we met a couple years ago, although I remember you probably more than you remember me when I did a workshop with you at a conference that was amazing, blew my mind, um, and really helped me with my own teaching practice. But then of course, we have a mutual friend who then shared with me 
what you had done for Orange Shirt Day, which was last fall, um, September 30th, 2019. Now, of course, uh, Orange Shirt Day is an annual event, takes place every year, but the, the work that I saw was from last year. Um, just so people know what Orange Shirt Day is, it's, um, again, it's an annual event uh, that are designed to commemorate the residential school experience, to witness and honor the um, healing journey and the survivors and their families, and to commit to the ongoing process of reconciliation. And so you involved your entire school in recognizing this very special day um, mm -hmm. through the performing arts. And so mm -hmm. after seeing that, with I just knew that I wanted to, to speak to yeah. you about this topic, especially because Orange Shirt Day is coming up next week. Yeah, I know, very uh, quickly. Is it next week? Oh, September 30th. I'm trying to remember where we are, but it's coming up very quickly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, I want to hear a lot about sort of how you did that, but maybe we can go back a little bit to what is it that got you started on this journey? So somebody who sees yourself as a guest, who is non-Indigenous, um, but obviously, you know, knowing that this is really critically important that we, you know, bring Indigenous education into our curriculum. We talk about these issues, mm -hmm. um, that we really look at histories and perspectives and uh, knowledges of Indigenous people. So what is it that really started your journey? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult, I can't pinpoint it exactly. I know that as a child, I was fascinated with indigenous culture. I grew up in downtown Toronto, mm -hmm. but I love, okay, I loved Emily Carr's paintings of the <laughs> totem poles and that might be where, and I, I get that there's a lot of problematic appropriation there, but I still, as a young child, would, I found it to be beautiful and romantic and this notion. And so, but I, I really uh, just read as much as I could. And so I think it's, always seemed to me that indigenous wisdom even though i grew up without knowing an indigenous person mm -hmm. um was the way <laughs> it just you know the, the idea of connecting to nature and all nature it it, it just seems like such an organic obvious uh, approach to life as human beings so mm -hmm. the connection i think to the natural world mm -hmm resonated resonates so strongly for me and I also didn't grow up religious at all we never went to church or anything like that but I f I feel a spirituality around connection to nature which many people do and I associate that with indigenous wisdom as well because mm -hmm. so that's all part of the deeper thing um but then when I was in teachers college I met uh Nancy Steele who's one of my professors there and who um was encouraging her students to really look at education through an indigenous perspective and making sure that we were going to teach you know indigenous history and uh, Canada's true history and residential schools and uh, it just seemed yeah, like yes that's the obvious way to go I never questioned how I was going to yeah so that's always been sort of my core teaching belief right wonderful yeah, and so Orange Shirt Day um, uh, so at this school, uh, there, yeah, there was 350 kids, grades one to six, uh, and I was responsible for teaching music and dance for all these kids. Mm -hmm. So we had, uh, we decided that the, we wanted to do a healing journey mm. in commemoration, and we wanted to involve the community. So we did it outside, and we did it as a moving uh dance piece that went around through the community and each dance and song were anchored to a tree so we went i had a nice uh, one of the parents at the school volunteered she's an arborist to help me get gain some knowledge around what these trees were that are in the park right mm -hmm. beside the school right. and so we chose seven trees that had um that were native species or had some significance in terms of medicine and uh then I had the assistance of another parent who is of Meti heritage who wrote the music, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the kids mm -hmm. learned the seven different songs for each of the seven trees and then the seven dances to go. And the audience moved from tree to tree. Wow. And uh, yeah, I know. And then it ended with a circle in the, in the schoolyard. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. 
I saw a lot of the footage with trees and, and, you know, how students were circling around trees and mm -hmm. yeah, just, it was lovely that it was all done outdoors in nature too, which of course is beautiful because it connects back to what you said about how much you connect to nature in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That must've been quite a lot of students to coordinate. <laughs> Well, you know, given that we put it together in two weeks, right, at the beginning of school was, but I've been fortunate to have built and nurtured a dance program in the school so that the students, as they come up, are accumulating experience. So, you know, performing is, is natural to them. They're used mm -hmm. to the rehearsal process. They're used to the skills that mm -hmm. they would need. So, yeah, we were able to put it together very quickly. Right. Now, you've done other things as well with using the performing arts to address Indigenous issues. Would you be able yeah. to share something, some other things that you've done? Oh, yeah. We, um, uh, several years ago, it was, again, a large ensemble piece, but on the stage, really telling a story mm -hmm. uh, about you know, the truth about uh, residential schools. And then last, or a couple of years ago, we um expanded that idea and we followed the sort of core of the four directions medicine wheel to, to present four pieces of a story about the treaties and <clears throat> how they were broken and um so there was a narrative that threaded through but the kids all got to perform their section of the dance that was oh it was heavy right and and we had um again a parent volunteer who um made a visual of images that the children had drawn uh, from their understanding of the residential school experience. And so you see that the learning is happening on so many levels, right? Mm -hmm. there, and, uh, and then they dance, and then they, they, they dance um, through the narrative and to express mm -hmm. that, that narrative journey. And, um, all the all all the varying sentiments and human responses that are mm -hmm. that go along with that story Whew, so yeah. how, do you, how do you feel um what, what do you think is the difference between learning about say residential schools or treaties or whatever it is that we're we're you know bringing into the curriculum through an embodied experience as opposed to you know reading a story, um, doing a reflection, having a discussion. And of course, not that those things are not important, but there's something that you're doing that's actually, I think personally, as a sort of dance educator, I think is very important. I think you would know more about the science of this <laughs> than I do. I mean, I understand that when you learn yeah. something kinesthetically, yeah laid down as a um the it's, it's i don't know that's your science and you have the words for that what i see is, what you see is what yeah, i see what you, what is 100 percent engagement i see okay. these, like you you would know but the kids now 350 kids now the whole school is working on this dance together and so they all know the dance so when they're out in the playground they can sort of speak to each other through the vocabulary and through the ideas of this language and especially in a inner city school where lots of kids don't have English as their first language or right. as their language at all <laughs> they they have perfect communication right. through, through this work so that's one part of it um I I feel like moving with a given structure and a given theme allows you to enter it in a way that you might not through just reading or, mm -hmm. or discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see that through the kids and they, you know, they're never going to forget the story because they embodied they, it. They embodied it. Exactly. And I was just thinking about, you know, how, and, and maybe, you know, you don't have the answer to this. Um, it depends on whether they, you know, you heard students remark on it or if the questions were asked, but like, you know, could they themselves feel like, could they actually have a perspective, a new perspective, because they could embody it in some way that they could feel that, yes, this would be incredibly painful, like to have to leave my home, to have the loss of my 
language, the loss of my culture, what I've known, like, you know what I mean? Like, so that experience of dancing the emotion to, you know, through the story can totally change how it is that we come to terms with the experience of other. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Yes, 100%. Also, I'm going to, I think that the creative process itself mm -hmm. or that, that creative process yeah. wheel that we know from the curriculum document, there's something quite magical about mm. that process that yes. helps to embed the learning. And uh, so the fact that they are performing, so they're, they're, you know, collaborating, they're building mm -hmm. this together. We're building it, building it gradually. Yes. Each time coming back to that same place of learning. So there's a repetition that is really mm. important. And then there's sort of the editing, you know, where we're finding, oh, this is too long. Let's problem solve. Let's mm -hmm. fix that. Oh, we need her over here, whatever. Those kinds of problems, which are fun and, and super engaging. And then you get to the performance, which is, this is your chance to tell this story out to the public. Right. Look, how empowering is that? The children are the teachers, which is how it should be. And they're... Um, proud of the work and they should be and then and they're experiencing this moment together with the community their parents their families and uh we always end the um performances with a round dance and we were mm -hmm. so fortunate to well we still um we have a neighbor who is uh of indigenous ancestry and she's so she, her grandson was, graduated from the school and uh, was my student. And um, anyway, she's always volunteered to lead the round dance and she has her drum and she just takes us in this beautiful circle and the whole school gets to join in. And I mean, that's clearly an experience you don't forget, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? It's embedded, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, did you have any um, support through the process, through the creative process of building um, this full school performance. You mentioned about um, a Métis parent, I believe, who uh, created the music, again, the ending of the performance, but any of the pieces in between were there? Um... Yeah. Yes, 100%. I was super fortunate um, to take part in a year-long learning at the Aboriginal Education Center mm. with a group of arts teachers. Okay. And um, I can't tell you how fortunate we were to have that year of learning. So the, this was where the, the teachers, the, the elders, the wisdom keepers that they brought to speak mm -hmm. to us every, like every time a new person. And the, the, uh, we were just so humbled by the guest speakers that they brought in. Um, but this was, this was run by Tanya Sank and Mervy Sallow and um, and then as teachers we were each we were assigned instructional leaders in Indigenous education for our LC whatever our quadrant and uh, so we actually had you know a, a, an Indigenous educator that we could go to specifically with questions as we were but the but the point of this year of learning was to integrate it was Indigenous arts and education or Indigenous education through the arts is something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the idea in the end pro at the end was to really have their students doing this work mm. um, and having the confidence as a settler, as a non-Indigenous teacher to like uh, inf infuse, infuse the learning with this story that we have not been able to talk about as teachers because we are so uncomfortable talking about race. All of us are uncomfortable. It's not just teachers. And this, this discussion is urgently needed and we need to start to talk about white supremacy. And given that so many teachers are white, this is a conversation. Anyway, you know this, Tracy, but... Um, <laughs> no, but I, I think that's, I wanted to, I actually am so happy you brought it up because yeah. one, you mentioned confidence and it is so important that we build confidence in teachers to be able to step into this work. Because what I find, and I have, you know, been in teacher education now for almost 10 years, 
I have, um, you know, and even for myself, there are certain subjects that I, you know, spend a lot of time preparing and still feel very ill at ease to um, talk about. I've gotten better at it, but even I have to find my way through and, you know, that requires lots of self-reflection and lots of education, continuous reading and discussion and, and learning. Um, and so we have a lot of teachers who, you know, are still in that place of feeling uncomfortable. And what happens often when we feel uncomfortable is we flee. I'm just not going to do it at all. I'm not going to touch it. And I have had uh, many teacher candidates that I work with where they've gone into schools and they want to try to, you know, address residential schools, for example, and have been told by their associate teacher, oh, we don't talk about that in this class. You know, our students are too young or that's too difficult or that's, and there's many, you know, reasons for why this work is not necessarily being done. Yeah. So that approach is not gonna get us anywhere, is it? <laughs> like, <laughs> not. No. In, until we talk about the frank base racism that exists in this country and we're able to have conversations mm -hmm. we should be ill at ease like yeah i think that discomfort makes sense yes <laughs> like, right. so it's like owning it it's okay yeah and um what the wisdom that i was able to glean from all these indigenous leaders and incredible teachers at the Aboriginal Education Center was, there's no answer to mm. how to do this. There's no answer, there's no rule book, there's no, it's, it's, it is like you say, it's self-reflection. Are you okay with this? Do you feel you've done the research? Have I, do I understand this? And then the most critical question is, how, how does this impact Indigenous people? Is this bettering their lives is this serving them mm -hmm. and if it's not then nah -uh. you know if mm -hmm. this is going to take away then then so think about the impact think about the impact for your students for potential uh students of indigenous descent at your school what what is how much is this work going to make their lives better mm. right that's the critical question i think Absolutely. Yeah. And that we can always learn when we do something that doesn't sort of work as we imagine. So, you know, I've talked to students about this as well. Like sometimes we perpetuate the same harm that what it is that we're actually trying to sort of move away from. Yeah. Once you have the awareness, you can learn from it. And that's the thing is I always say, you, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. You're not always going to get it right. Even those that have been doing the work for years and years, I mean, you know, we're, we're always working with human beings and therefore we can't always get a sense of, of how things are going to be perceived and received and all of that. Yeah. So, you know. You know what's interesting? Sorry to cut you off, but I no. think uh, another aspect is the vulnerability required mm -hmm. to be an artist to, to, to express yourself through the arts. Yeah almost opens us up to a place where we are able to be, I don't know, more empathetic and more mm -hmm. recognize the humanness in each other. So mm -hmm. not to go too distant from what you're saying, but. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's something about being in our bodies and having an experience of our bodies and being able to almost step into the shoes of another you know, through a particular experience that can be transformative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's partly part of what you're saying. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. 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 And um, what I discovered, one thing that we discovered, and I, I wonder how many other school teachers and schools are having this experience. Of when you start embedding indigenous wisdom and practice and you start making the space you know safer for kids of uh, ind indigenous kids and and metis um you start to discover you got a lot more indigenous students than you thought <laughs> as soon as it's safe then they come out and and you discover right absolutely and uh and then all of a sudden you can begin the process of saying who you are is 
the most wonderful person mm -hmm. and you can start to build on that hurt that is you know in, under this maybe intergenerational trauma or, or the oppression of the racism and start to build up the kid who's felt like they were dirty and wrong and mm. dumb and everything else and and then you can you know just give them a high five and say miigwech or some some piece of that uh of who they are that mm. anyway I, I think if we make our schools better for indigenous kids we're on the right track absolutely yeah yeah you have shared so many wonderful things today I, 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 you know, my, I'm just having all these light bulbs in my head, like, oh, I could talk to you for another hour. Um, <laughs> but I, we probably do need to come to a close just yeah. for the timing of Body Talk. But before we go, was there anything, any sort of last thoughts, uh, any tips, anything that you might want to finish with? Mm. Hey, can I show you something totally unrelated? This is the land acknowledgement that we do. I just remembered this. Okay. Um, so with the kids, when the, if, it, you know, sometimes they play the land acknowledgement over the PA and okay. I want for them to have an embodiment of that. So as they're listening, we would like to acknowledge that we're on the land of, and then we, we acknowledge each other. And then we go down and when they're, they actually touch the ground to acknowledge the land and they actually have to imagine feeling the earth down through the floor and they tap to show their connection yeah. and then they bring themselves this is a gesture to say i am committed to mm. climate activism or whatever it is that they're going to work on recycling and then they acknowledge each other and then they, they clap five times and this is um, how we open our assemblies and stuff like that as a land acknowledgement we say the words as well but they physicalize it too that's beautiful. I, I've never seen that. I've been a part of many land acknowledgements, but never with the, you know, the movement. That yeah. is amazing. I would love to see more schools do that, or at least teachers bring that into their classroom. That's lovely. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, maybe I'll, I'll send you a video of the kids doing it. Oh, that's great. Now, with that said, is, um, I would love to be able to show the clip as well from Orange yeah. Shirt Day yeah. and anything else. So I'll make sure that those, once we have our um, sort of the notes, we always have little notes sort of how anybody can reach you or again, see mm -hmm. the work that you've done, that they have access to that. So yeah. I'll make sure that when we post this, that that information will be there. Cool, Tracy, that's great. Wonderful. Well, Arwen, it has been a joy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. And I just want to say to all of you who are <laughs> who have been watching, um, thank you so much for being here with us. Again, for more information on Embodied Learnings, you can go to www.embodiedlearnings.com. And until next time, thank you so much. Bye, everyone.